dear colleague, friends, comrade, wherever you are, whenever you are, brothers and sisters, I greet you with all the greetings that you like. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I hope that you are uh, living uh, a tranquil life, inshallah, peaceful, prosperous, safe life, whenever you are, wherever you are in this uh, world, which is full of problems. Today we'll be talking about my first uh, get out of the COVID cocoon to try to plan a uh, longer journey uh, since uh, 2019 or beginning of 2020, inshallah. And uh, as you can see, the image in front of you reflects the, the trap that you have been having over the last two years by COVID itself. Let us thank first my colleague Aya Abu Zainab who prepared the PowerPoint presentation and start our discussion. Not only myself has been trapped in this uh, trap over the last two years, but the whole world was actually trapped inside the cocoon of COVID-19 trap. It affected, took, it claimed millions of lives. It claims many, many millions of people who became sick with complication. It affected our social life, economical life, moral life, behavior, customs, and everything. And even it affects our relationship with our families, with our friends, with our colleague, with our comrade as well. It affects the whole life that actually changed, changed us completely. And uh, I found an opportunity over the last month or so to get out of this trap of COVID-19, of COVID-19 cocoon, I called it, and to have the freedom of movement or the free movement. I planned it willingly to go to visit two countries and try to test my ability to do different things. One of them was Qatar. The second one was uh, Turkey. Let me take you with me during my journey, journey which was 16 days between these two countries. Why? What why? What was my objective of visiting these two countries? And what was my program as well? Five objectives. First of all, to test my physical ability. Will I be able to travel between cities, towns, countries, by air, by road? It's number one, mobility. Number two, testing my communication skills with different people that I have not been communicated face, communicating face with, to face with them over the last two years, especially in these two countries. Okay, communication, it's a change of experience, change, share my vision and views with other people and the other generation. This is the second objective. The third objective, I was accompanied by two young female humanitarian workers in, in Turkey from your generation for about eight days. The fourth objective was to plan for what I'm planning for is a program, future leadership program, which was my dream since 20, 2004. Number five is considering this journey is the first link in a long chain towards building this movement of building the future, young future leaders. Five objectives. 
These are the images of the young people, which I'll send it to you later on on YouTube. Two young girls with me traveled and I met others in different places. The program was number one, visiting different humanitarian organizations and development organization. Why? To understand and realize how far they were ahead, progressing, or standing still, or regressing. Alhamdulillah, I found some of them are progressing very fast. Number two, visiting some officials in these countries to learn from them about the vision for their organizations and their sectors. Number three is in the program, organizing special meetings with whom? With young people. Why? To learn from their experience, to learn from their experience, the experience of the young people, and being exposed to their thinking, to their way of thinking. Number four, to organize lectures and workshops with organizations, with youth groups as well. Number five, to discover young people's new talents. Five part of our program. Our program was exploratory. Exploratory, exploring. After this, actually, uh, period of being cut off from face-to-face -face communication with the outside world. This is the image which I talked about. I, the, the two young, uh, the, the two female inside the cocoon and the uh, young man. Everybody, everything has been changed, 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 changed. Unfortunately, nowadays, because of actually the trap, the COVID-19 trap, 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 as I mentioned earlier on. How long the freedom movement mission took? 16 days, 384 hours. The average working hour every day was between 12 to 14 hours, sometimes more, especially when you meet with young people who are very enthusiastic and they can be with you in the hotel or in your room or whatever it is in that in a cafeteria or in a restaurant till about midnight. The average sleeping hour was between four to six hours. The average time for traveling, food and refreshment, it was between four and eight hours. So it was very tiring, alhamdulillah, program. This was the first mission. Okay, if I can take you through the first mission, what did we do? We visited two countries, five cities, Doha, Rehaneya in Turkey, Ghazi Antab, Antakya, and Istanbul. Five cities, two countries. We organized 16 public meetings, workshops, and talks, and one TV interview on Al Jazeera. We organized 19 private meetings with young people to discuss different issues during this actually 16 days or 384 hours. I have uh, the young humanitarian female workers from Spain and from Italy. One of them was uh, Sarah, who is in blue, and Hana is in pink. Hana was from Italy, and Sara is from, so Hana is from Spain, Sara is from Italy. And they were accompanying me, as I said, for eight days, shadowing me, or I'm shadowing them. A question raised by some young people like yourself, did we succeed or not? My answer is yes. 
But the young man and the young girl told me, how? Let us, what's your evidence of having success in this success story in these 16 days or 384 hours? Number one, Alhamdulillah, <coughs> I, I, I we managed to finish the 384 hours mission. No physical problem and no health problem. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. 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 Point number three, the, the, young, the state of young people absorption and the assimilation to what was discussed in the two countries. They are so enthusiastic. They're like a fer dry, fertile land, need water, need drops of water to bring its fruits out. The heat of discussion, the different kind of questions, the diversity of the questions, the eager to learn and to expose themselves to our experience. This was actually the third one. Number four, the powerful plea, belief and enthusiasm of whom? Of the two young girls who accompanied me for eight days. And you can contact them if you want. And they decided uh, to be the ones who will be writing the initial steps of the program of the future leadership. Okay. Number five, the willingness. Let us talk about the old people. Reluctantly, I gave him two talks in two different cities. One of them was in Antakya, and there was a stop. So one of the audience said, why are you talking theoretically? The second one was in Ghazi Antab in Istanbul. The same question. First one was from a man. Second one was from a woman. Both of them were expert in humanitarian and development field. My answer was, yes, I am going to talk about theories, not the actual program you are doing every day, food distribution, clothes, humanitarian response, shelter. This thing that I've been doing it for 25, 30 years. Now it is a time to ask each and every one of you to think about philosophy, about culture, about moral values, about ethics, that we can produce to let others to follow our moral values, ethics, culture, and philosophy of thinking. This was my answer to the lady in Ghazi Antab, and she reluctantly accepted my theoretical discussion. Philosophical, intellectual, cultural, value-based, and moral is necessary to what? To lay down the foundations of, of what? Listen to this. Of policies, laws, drawing the parameters and the direction for the future generations. These things, we have to focus on it. We always focus on firefighting. We always focus on fire on firefighting. Some of us has to think on the other direction. Who is going to produce the policies? We should. Who is going to create the new laws? We should. Who is going to, going to make the new culture and to put the ethical values for others? We should. We should. We should. That's why some of us, since I left the executive role, about 14 years ago, this is what my thoughts, this is my thoughts, these are my thoughts, sorry. The last point in to prove our success is the desire of all young people, middle age, and all people who met in the two countries, in the five cities, during this 16 uh, public meeting and 19 private discussion, to connect. Everyone wants to connect for learning, gaining experience and knowledge. Whether I gain from them or the exchange the experience and knowledge between both of us. This was our proof. 
Uh, another question came, which seems for people to be a stupid question, but it's true question. It's true. Why and how did we succeed? Why we succeeded? You know why? Because during this siege inside the COVID cocoon, I was in touch with young people like yourself through Zoom and different mean, uh, means of social media. Okay? Doing what? We were engaging with them, myself and others, asking for their ideas. I was asking for their ideas, asking them to prepare some lectures. And you can find, if you go back to my lectures, some of them have already prepared some lectures and have, have acknowledged them. Asking them to identify the points of discussion for our meetings here and there. Responding to the questions, problems happening inside Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, in Sudan, and other countries as well. Responding to their questions, inquiries, and together, together, both of us, finding solution for such problems. That's why, that's why we were not out of touch or continuously communicating with them. My last message to you, young people, you know that today my talk is not going to be as long as other times. The freedom or free movement, which I made, have renewed my hope and gave me this magnanimous positive energy. When you, as if you were in, in, in prison and you get outside the, your prison cell, get outside the doors of the prison itself, to smell the air of freedom, this gave you this magnanimous energy, positive energy. Enabled me to continue this hard work over the last 16 days. After being put off shelf, I was just like anybody. All of us were forced to sit at home. Like you see, this is one of the rooms in my house. Please, young people, young people, don't think or believe that I am showing off the strength of someone, especially talking about myself, or intellectual capability or creativity. No way. Or communication superpower, no way, ultimately not, not, not. But on the contrary, I present for you the reality of what we have of financial, social, human resources, impediment, and limitation. Because we don't have this kind of facilities, we have to do it ourselves the good old days way, travel, meet, talk, communicate, connect, discuss, and test your ideas, test your ability, test your skills, and see if you are out of date or not. I present for you huh, our intellectual, thought-provoking, philosophical, value-based, and aspirational forward looking dreams of ours to make them our dreams, huh? The fuel for your positive energy. Say it again. I present for you our intellectual, so provoking, so provoking philosophical, value based, and aspirational forward looking dreams to make them the fuel for your positive energy. You have to have a positive energy and we can provide you with this. If you walk on, step on my body, if you think that my body will be your positive energy, step on it, I have no problem with that. Such energies will enable us, you and, I, and me, to fulfill our dreams and meet the expected needs of our sites. High expectation especially during this gloomy time affecting all of us, particularly 
the Muslim communities here and there. Dear young people, please don't make and listen to this again and again and again with my finger pointing like this. Don't make financial, organizational, age, cultural, intellectual, philosophical, and values impediment. All this impediment, don't make it impediment. Real hindrance, don't make it hindrance or barriers. Stopping you huh? or stopping your freedom, stopping your free constructive social movement. I have no resources, so what? I have no money, so what? I have no organization, so what? I'm old man, old woman, so what? I don't think I'm highly qualified for having a PhD or master, so what? I don't understand what you mean by value-based. So what? So what? Start. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't ever make them impediments to hinder your constructive social movement. But instead, make them ways and paths of communication between you and others. You and others, you and others. Bridges and the crossing to reach the good and decent developments of other societies. You have to understand what's happening to other societies. Parameters, policies, and laws that you create and you must create. I'm saying it, we must create and should be followed. This is my challenge should be followed by other nations and different generations. We are at the receiving end all the time. The time has come when you, others will be at the receiving end of looking at your value base, your culture, your philosophy, your ideas, your all this that you can create for humanity. The formidable challenges facing us are eight challenges. Eight challenges. Eight challenges. Number one, do we have enough civil liberty spaces in our society or not? Or are being controlled by autocratic, militarized, securitized regimes? You have to stand up firm and fight for available civil, civil liberty space for yourself and sufficient civil liberty space because there's no pioneering, no innovation without civil liberty. It's number one of the formidable challenges to find the civil or to make and create the civil liberty space. Number two, civility of the state. Is our state a civilian state or military controlled, autocratic or theocratic, or whatever you call it? It has to be civil state. And this is what we need to fight for. Number two, we have as community, we have as organization to create the critical individuals like you from the young age. And such critical individuals, if we have the sufficient civil liberty space, will be able to create the critical masses, which will be able to make the positive social change and take the society forward, take the country forward, and both solution for all our problems. This is the third challenge. The fourth challenge is awareness. Social and societal awareness. I keep saying, giving the example of uh, Chijifara, was fighting, I think, for Bolivia at that time in the mountains. And the informer to the police was a farmer whom Chijifara was fighting for his liberty. You know why the farmer informed the police? to capture Chijifara, because every time he used to come to the mountain, 
the police were after him. And this make the sheep of this farmer to run away and scream and, and, and. No awareness. No, he did not know the value of Chijifara at that time. For other people who bought their neck on the guillotine to save their own society. Keep, keep, keep raising the social and societal awareness day in and day out. They're all the means that you have. The fifth formidable challenge is building independent state institutions. In certain countries, state institutions are still controlled by the president, still controlled by the prime minister. There's no independency. Still controlled by the king or by the prince or by the sheikh. Stand up and fight for the independence of the state institution, as well as create civil society sector having a strong, affecting, independent civil society organizations. This is number five. Number six, building strong communication systems between different generations. We must not isolate ourselves from younger generations. I'll give you an example. Once upon a time, I was attending the Board of Management of Islamic Leaf, 1995-96. Fundraising was discussed kind of fundraising. And uh, I had some crazy ideas at that time. I went to my room. I wear, put on a costume. You know what costume I was wearing? The Mickey Mouse one. Because I was giving the message to the senior people from Europe who came to the meeting, telling them, if you attract the young toddler, he or she will be able to attract the parents to pay the money as donation for your organization. So I came with Mickey Mouse costume to attend top level board of management meeting, and I was the chair. I was the chair. And the people from Islamic, if you might remember that, said oh, it was very funny because my head was going this way, my hand was going this way, and my body was going this way and coming back like a yo-yo. Communication and complementary system, you have to complement with others. You shouldn't work in isolation to others as well. Number seven, creating new job opportunities. If we go to Africa nowadays, or to Middle East, or to Asia, or to Latin America, find a higher level of unemployment. And governance might not have enough big budget to create jobs. Let us stumble, start actually, especially actually whether, whether you are in a stable state or in a state where you are a displaced, a displaced individual, or a refugee. My philosophy of thinking of finding a job for those people is number one, to create the social market or the community market. Community market will enable every young man and woman, everyone in the community to be able to produce something to be sold on daily basis. Like we have it nowadays here in UK, so we call it open market. You can hire the table for a very small cost to keep money coming. And this will be a part of the informal economy of the country. Number two, invest in agriculture and livestock. The country who does not invest in agriculture and livestock is a vulnerable country. People sometimes think that we are a very rich country because we have oil, but the technology is coming from abroad. Or we trade because we have ports, but you don't produce your food. has been proved by many scientists that the most vulnerable countries are the countries who are not producing their own food. Encouraging and promoting young people initiatives. Young people initiatives, young, yani you have to take it seriously. To invest in the capability 
of the sector which called it the sector of young people. Never ignored them. Because all, we all were young. Nobody was investing in us. But nowadays, we learn the trade. We have to invest in them. Young people initiatives. Number four, education. Start with vocational education and all alternative kinds of education. Because not every child loves to learn all the subjects which have been taught to him or to her in the state school. Particularly if you are in displacement or as a refugee, and you find in the Syrian refugees, you maybe have two to three million people out of school. What to do with them? You have to give them a profession, a job to do. And number five is creating and enhancing the voluntary sector. You have to create a voluntary sector, wherever you are going. Because volunteerism is one of the methods of creating future leadership. This is point number seven, or the formidable challenge number seven. The most formidable challenge number eight, which is how can we create the future leader? And this is my dream. If my daughter, uh, Shikofta, which is there, she's my, not my, my daughter and my, my, my teacher, and my teacher said Zenari as well. It was a dream nearly 18 years ago. And we started doing it emotionally and planned. We can create this young future leaders through two paths. First one, the emotional and planned path. How? Me as a manager or me as a director or me as a chairman have to train the young people under my leadership face to face. Face to face. And maybe somebody like Shigofta might tell you how he did use to it, but it was have done ad hoc and haphazardly. It succeeded. It produced a lot of good people who want to work in different uh, organization and became superstar. This is number one. Number two is call it individual directive educative on the online program. As I mentioned to you earlier, you connect with other people in different countries, mentor them over the online. It works and they have success stories. Number three, to take people with you to travel as a group of people. Like I mentioned to you, I was accompanied by two young girls from Italy and Spain. So this is on the individual basis. If you don't have resources, you should not, you should not, you should not sit down doing nothing. You should not sit down doing nothing. Either you are teaching and educating and directing the younger, or communicating with them through Zoom and social media, or letting them to accompany you as a group to travel and mentoring them during the trip. This is the emotional and planned path, how to create the future leadership. The second one is more organized, academia. If you have the organization, if you have the resources, if you have the staff, you should do the second pass. You should go through the second pass, which is divided in two parts. One of them is the academic program. It's a master's degree. You are aiming in uh, applied master's degree in humanitarian and development fields. It's two components. Component number one is the academic program, which is organized by the university. Component number two is parallel program. Parallel applied program organized by us. Okay? Which made out of three things. A, applied practical training 
in the headquarters on finance, on fundraising, on media, on program and others. Then applied practical work in the field, project cycles, implementation, quality control, and connecting with the refugees or the displaced people or, or others. This is A. B, which is parallel to the academia, is mentoring the young people. How? By people who have the experience or successful, like if I gave you the examples, in, uh, if you know somebody, the late Dr. Abdurrahman Smith, if he stay alive, he should go and sit down with the young people, get them to absorb his knowledge, absorb his experience. Like Iji, uh, Abdul Sattar Iji, as well from Pakistan, sit down with you, tell you how he built this incredible organization. This is mentoring and coaching by the people who have the experience, not the consultant, not the consultant who come and read. No. People who have credibility, integrity, and success stories. We call it uh, knowledge transfer and living through or living with those people. This is B. The third part of the parallel program to the academia is who is going to teach us the moral values, the ethics, and the philosophy, and the culture. I have to get somebody who has the experience. So while we are in this master degree, giving the academic subjects or modules, parallel to it is applied training in the headquarter and the field office is mentoring program through people who have experience and success story. The third P is actually talking about the value, the culture, and the philosophy. After this, actually, what do you call it? Through this multiplicity of different paths, we'll be able to create whatever is the future leader for us, whether it's in humanitarian work, or it's in economical work, or it's in political work, or it is whatever kind of a speciality. The real challenge that we must face is, is, listen to this, making or creating, and I am adamant in that, making or creating what? The philosophical culture, and ideological values and principles for different societies. Khalas, enough is enough. But being followers for many, many years, after being leaders for centuries, now we have to become leaders again. Somebody might say that we don't have the resources, so what? When we started 38 years ago, we started with 20 pence, no desk, no office, no office, no address. So the real challenge that we must face is making or creating the philosophical culture, the philosophical, cultural, and the ideological values and principles. We have to do this for others to follow. And such a philosophy will be able to reshape, to reshape, to reshape the minds and souls of the future generations, not only of the Arabs or Asian, everywhere. If we cannot create the philosophical culture and the intellectual values and principles, we will be forced to follow strange, immoral, philosophical, cultural, and intellectual values and principles made for us by others, as we have been experiencing. And this is the challenge. You might say that we are facing Islamophobia. So what? Of difficulty of fundraising. So what? Pioneering is always coming under pressure. When you are under pressure, you can be motivated. You can be innovative. 
you can be pioneering because Allah gave us this box and then inside it, small piece of flesh, we're only using five to 10% of its capacity, not the hundred percent. So the time has come when people call us name, when people yani, ignored us, is to tell them we are going to lead you by example, regardless if you have resources or no resources. And this is the message for us young people. The image here is from the young girls and myself saying, bye, and we'll see you. The challenge was to be accompanying these two young girls for eight days, a young humanitarian worker from Islamic Relief Spain and Italy. And they promised to write the first chapter of the future leader program. Inshallah. May Allah bless you, inshallah. Next week, we'll be talking in English and Arabic about the different kind of organization that we are facing. I have 19 kinds. I wrote this 19 kinds yesterday and today. We'll discuss it next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for being patient with me.